Today we're in Psalm 150. It's a short psalm, but a really awesome psalm. And so our hope is today to grow in understanding of uh, why are these words in the Bible? How do they help us understand God, who he is, how he is in the world, and what that means for us and how should we respond? So I'm going to read it, we're going to pray, and we're going to get stuck into Psalm 150. <clears throat> this is how it starts. Hallelujah! Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him for his abundant greatness. Praise him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we are reading these scriptures and uh, we want to we wanna grow up in our understanding of them. We want to um, think more like Jesus as we gain the mind of Christ. And so please help us to be attentive to your spirit in step with your Holy Spirit as you're speaking to us today by your spirit through these scriptures. We don't want to just um, be puffed up with knowledge, but we do want to gain the mind of Christ. And so help us please today to grow into his likeness. And as we go in a lot of the things we learn today, help us to live more like him and love more like him. In whose name we pray, amen. So this psalm, the last psalm, after 149 other psalms that tell us uh, all about how great God is, <clears throat> tell us all about uh, kind of the highs of living as humans in the world, some of the desperate lows of living as humans in the world, um, the, the majesty of God's creation. The Psalms tell us of the, what, like the wonderful things that God has done for us. Um, some of the Psalms talk about being in fear for uh, the psalmist's life <clears throat> and kind of everything in between. And then we get to this Psalm and it's basically just one thought. Every third word, praise. Praise Yahweh here. Praise him there. Praise him like this. What the psalm does is answers the questions, who should praise God? When should that person praise God? How should they praise God? Where should they praise him? And why should they praise him? And so what we're going to do is we're just going to basically break it down into each thought, roll through these, and see how do they apply even to us. So right at the beginning, the very first word, in fact, first and last word, hallelujah. This is a word that we sometimes use, at, basically as an English word, we use it. It's not an English word, mind you. Uh, it's, a, it's a conjugation of Hebrew words, which basically means praise Yah, or, or a shortening for Yahweh. Praise the Lord is how we would um, translate it. Praise the Lord. But we transliterate it. Uh, bring it over and kind of adopt it as a word that we use, hallelujah. We kind of use this word usually where something that we would hope would happen, happens. And we're like, oh, hallelujah. And uh, kind of almost jokingly use this word, hallelujah, kind of in the modern um, you know, Australian vernacular. Oh, hallelujah. Or <clears throat> if there's something that, um, I don't know, cynically you think someone should do something or a politician should behave in a particular way or a big corporation or someone that you don't necessarily expect to act in a particularly good way but then they do surprisingly act in a good way and you're like, well, hallelujah. Kind of almost sarcastically is kind of how we use it. But in scripture, this is an imperative. This is, this is saying to us, praise Yahweh. Praise him. This word praise, we, we sang it before. The word praise, what does it mean? It means to boast. It means to speak well of. It means to celebrate. It denotes a joyous exclamation when we say praise Yahweh, praise the Lord. It means we're speaking well of and it features in every sentence of this psalm. We see praise mentioned. And so what do we know about this psalm so far? It is about praise, about speaking well of, even about joyously, ex um, joyously exclaiming 
a boast about God. That's what we're doing. When we say praise, that's what we're talking about. A joyous boast about who God is. And it goes on and tells us, praise God, so boast about Yahweh in his sanctuary. Speak well of him or praise him, boast about him, joyously exclaim about him in his mighty expanse. What is this telling us? It's starting with remember where God is. He is in his sanctuary. If you're here for the Revelation series, Revealing Jesus, uh, over and over and over again throughout this letter of Revealing Jesus, we see a picture of God, Yahweh, on his throne, in his sanctuary, far and above all things. And then these kind of concentric circles around him of his angels and the heavenly host and 24 elders and all of God's people surrounding him singing his praise, boasting about his excellencies, his magnificence, his gloriousness, his majesty. And the psalmist is reminding us, why do we praise God? Because he is far and above all things. He starts by reminding us of where God is. Where do we worship him? We worship him from wherever we are, and we are worshiping him in his sanctuary, on his throne, a reminder of the majesty and the authority of God. In case you're wondering why do we praise God, we praise God because he is the one on the throne. In his own right, he is praiseworthy. He's God over all things, And his throne is far above all other thrones. Where else do we praise him? In his mighty expanse. So where he is seated on his throne, kind of in a a singular place, but also in his expanse of creation, in all of the world, in his mighty expanse. So he is everywhere. There's nowhere we can go where God isn't. And so he's showing us not only is he high and above all things, but he is expansive and everywhere and glorious over all of creation. He is worthy of our praise. So when we praise him when we gather because he's here with us. We praise him when we scatter and go about our lives because he is there. We praise him because we, we as we saw in the psalm a couple of weeks ago, you know, we, we can go down into Sheol, into the place of the dead, into the dust, and he's there. We can go into the highest heavens and he's there. We go to the east and to the west, he's there. We can't go further north than he is or further south than he is. We can't go into the expanse of the universe further than he already is. He is everywhere and magnificent. And so we boast about him because his authority is over all authority and because he is, his majesty is more expansive than even creation. He is not a part of creation that he is subject to creation other than the fact that he took on flesh when the word became flesh in Jesus. Verse 2, praise him, boast about him, joyfully exclaim for his powerful acts, praise him for his abundant greatness. So um, the psalmist is saying praise him for what he does, praise him for who he is. These are two reasons to praise him. So he's firstly... Uh, if we could take the second point first, we can boast in him. We can praise him. We can speak well of him purely because of who he is, abstract of everything else, abstract of even us and what he's done for us or anything that he has done, purely because of his inherent majesty, his inherent glory, he is worthy of praise. No matter what he's done, just because of who he is. So praising God, speaking well of him, boasting about him, joyously exclaiming about God is not contingent on how my day is going. It's not contingent on the circumstances of my life right now. This is one of the reasons that King David, like the chief psalmist, if you like, uh, his life is such a great picture of this kind of praise, where he's saying, man, even when I am rebelliously sinful, God is still worthy of praise. Even when my life is going awesome, he's still worthy of praise. Even when I'm being chased, by my enemies and at my death's door, God is worthy of being praised. Even uh, in my own crowning glory, I have nothing to boast in other than the boast of the Lord, the boast of Yahweh. When we kind of layer David's life over our life, <clears throat> you may never be objectively as great as sinner as David, 
You may never have as high a highs as King David or as low a lows as King David. You may never be pursued for your life. People trying to kill you like David. But you're going to have some really good days and you're going to have some really bad days. Well, the psalmist here is helping us understand uh, God's greatness is not contingent on how good our life is going. He's always worthy of praise. Abstract of all of our lives. Things are going awesome in your life right now. And I know that there are people among us whose life is going pretty awesome at the moment. Work's going really well. Family life's going really well. And I know there are people among us whose hearts are breaking at the moment. Because loved ones are at death's door. Because relationships are really fractured and broken. And kind of everything in between. And in no way am I saying that none of those things matter. They really do matter. In fact, we're about to get to the matter of those things. But saying that actually in spite of all of those things, God is intrinsically, inherently worthy of our praise. But then also, God is worthy of praise because of what he's done. Actually, let me go one thing back into God being worthy of praise. In Psalm 145, Someone says, I will exalt you, my God, my King. I'll bless your name forever and ever. Every day I'll bless you and I'll praise your name forever and ever. Great is Yahweh and worthy of great praise. There are no limits to the extent of his greatness. Is how the psalmist puts it just a few uh, psalms earlier. There's no limit to the extent of his greatness. God is worthy of our praise because he's worthy. Why is God worthy? Because he's worthy. There's no limit. We can't plumb the depths of his greatness. We can't summit the heights of his majesty. He's far and above all things, including our own understanding, and he's worthy of our praise. And he's worthy of praise because of what he's done for us. So when we meet together on a Sunday, one of the primary reasons, if not the primary reason we gather, is to praise God, is to worship Him, is to boast of His excellencies, is to remind ourselves corporately together of how glorious He is. It's actually to take our eyes off ourselves and onto Him. But then also take our eyes back onto ourselves. So taking our eyes off of us and onto Him and His greatness him in his sanctuary, where we praise him, on his throne, purely volitional, does as he pleases. And then remind ourselves, as we put our eyes back on ourselves, in light of who he is, we think about what has he done. How has he, in light of how otherly he is, in light of his holiness, in light of his justice, in light of his majesty, in light of his volition, like him doing whatever he wants to do uh, in accordance with his character. Then we think, and how has he treated us? What has he done for us? We don't just praise him because of his intrinsic greatness. We boast of him because of his great works. We look at creation and we boast in him. Psalmist does this all the time. He says, wow, look at the stars. Look at the sun. Look at the seas. All of them declaring the greatness of our God. You think these things are amazing. God breathed and they came into existence. Imagine his greatness. Consider what he's done. Consider his love for us. Consider his justice. Consider his, for us at least, uh, from our vantage point, consider his saving work in Jesus. We praise him for his great acts. Consider he made us a new family. In him, sons and daughters of the Most High. We praise him for his great acts. He's given us a new nature, a new future, a new inheritance, a sure hope. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us comfort when things are difficult. He's given us joy when things seem or are bleak. We praise him for his great acts. Man, he... He is worthy of our praise, worthy of our boast, in spite of his acts, 
But then we also consider his acts and his, his disposition towards us, ill-deserving rebels. Oh my goodness, he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our boast. We don't add to his glory by worshipping him. We can't add to his glory. His glory is boundless and limitless already. But we acknowledge his glory. How are we to praise him? Verse 3, praise him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Any tambourine fans? Zero tambourine fans. One tambourine fan. That's okay. Dance, any dancing fans? A few more dancing fans. One dancing fan was also a tambourine fan. We've got some momentum there. Praise him with the strings and the flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. The Psalms are saying, make a great noise. Praise him with everything you can find. Every tool they had, every instrument that they had, had made to make a noise, make a beautiful noise on the one hand and make a clanging noise on the other hand. It says, use it all. Whatever you can find, use it. Every tool you have. When I was a kid growing up, my grandparents, uh, both long past now, um, but back when I was a kid, they used to have a house up on Mount Osmond, uh, Santa Maria Drive, that kind of over, overlooked, I'm talking like mammoth panoramic views of the entire city. It was awesome. And uh, my family didn't, my kind of mum and dad and family didn't grow up in Adelaide, but every year we'd come back to Adelaide and we'd go up there for New Year's Eve. <clears throat> and every year, New Year's Eve, we would, as a family, ring in the new year from this amazing vantage point. You know, we'd see all of the fireworks displays, uh, kind of the whole city celebrating. And it was kind of our job as Reddens to make as much noise as we could. So we'd take things, we... I mean, we, we had uh, like those conch shells, uh, pots and pans, wooden spoons, literal cymbals, actual horns. Uh, I'm talking like trumpets and uh, all kinds of things. And we'd go out on the balcony, overseeing Adelaide, wait for the countdown, not like we do with our kids, and call, you know, 9 p.m. We say, it's merely midnight, let's do a countdown. But it's really 9 o'clock, so they all go to bed. It was actually midnight, or maybe it wasn't, but I thought it was, you know, at least... <laughs> as I remember it, actually midnight. <clears throat> and we'll just make as much noise as we could. And it was a horrendous sound, but at the same time, it was a really awesome, glorious sound. And we loved it. And actually, as kids, we'd just dance around, yay, it's the new year, as if the new year is something worth celebrating in light of the glories of God. The psalmist is saying, man, just use what you have. When you dance, uh, one of my kids, he just cannot help himself but to dance. And it's awesome. We're walking around a shopping center, if there's music, bam, this kid is dancing and he uses his whole body to dance. And it's, it's wonderful. And everybody who sees it is immediately kind of wells up with joy, seeing the joy of this kid dance with his whole being. And that's what the psalmist is reflecting when we consider the gloriousness of God in who he is, and then we consider what he's done, it would be an all-of-body response with singing, with tools like instruments that can make noise, even just clanging ones. You, you might think, man, when I sing, I am that clanging symbol, therefore I will not sing. That is not how it goes. If your voice, you think, is the clanging symbol, let it ring to the glory of God. With all of your life, with every breath, and that's how the psalm finishes, let everything that breathes praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. It just finishes. Praise the Lord. Praise Yah. Everything that has breath. Every creature. There are other <clears throat> psalms that talk about just all of creation, even inanimate things. Or like radiating praise, boasting in themselves of how glorious God is. And this psalm is saying everything that has breath, if you can breathe, use it to praise Yahweh. Use it to boast in his name. 
use it to joyously, joyfully exclaim about his greatness. It's what we're made for. And we ex- instinctively do this when amazing things happen. We use our breath and our bodies. We instinctively do this. You're watching your favorite team uh, play in a grand final and they win that grand final or you know, whatever it is, premiership, pennant, World Series, World Cup, uh, your whole body, yeah, you know, hands go up, fists are clenched, yeah, voice goes out, have you, maybe this is you, uh, you meet someone, uh, you, you get to work with someone on a Monday morning, and the voice is a bit hoarse, and you're like, oh, are you feeling all right? Like, yep, not COVID, just at my son or daughter's sport on the weekend, like yelling at them, yay, cheering or at the footy or whatever, cheering. I saw a video during the week of uh, a, uh, apparently one of the best rock climbers in the world. And uh, all the video is is just this last kind of, you know, carabiner into a loop or whatever. And this guy just goes nuts. Like his whole body, kind of almost like an epileptic fit, kind of just flailing around. And there's comments on this video going, oh, who is it? Like, what's the story with this? Good on you. But then... These rock climbers get on and say, you don't understand. He has just climbed the most difficult peak and he's the best. He's the top rock, you know, rock climber doing the hardest rock climbing thing and he finally made it. He said, if you understood the greatness of the situation, you'd be flailing about like him too. I'm just re- watching that in light of this and thinking, yeah, man, he's using his whole body because of the greatness of that achievement. And then when we zoom one of our Cedarlight family who's in hospital and, uh, what, you know, not doing really awesome, but in this, you know, hour or so that I spent with him and some of his family, he just spent the entire time singing the praises of, his, of the kids, of his kids that were there, just telling them how proud of them he was, how wonderful a time was with them, singing the praises of his wife who was there with him, and he, he just over and over and over again was talking about how great God had been to him, how great God was, how thankful he was. And I was just, obviously, you know, we were all pretty emotional, family in particular, but just to see a guy who had that zoomed out perspective of life, to see how great God is in his own right, but then to come down and, and consider his own life and how great God has been to him. So the psalmist, every line, saying, praise God, praise God, praise God. We need to turn our minds to God regularly, daily. Consider him just in his abstract glory. And then also consider his wonderful works, abstract of us, and then also towards us. And let it well up, bubble up uh, from within us and result in an kind of all of body, certainly all of our breath, joyful exclamation, a boast. We don't boast in ourselves. Don't boast in whatever righteousness we can muster up. Don't boast in our greatest achievements because as we see them in the light of the expansive majesty of God, uh, he, he alone is worthy of praise. So we're going to gather around the table. We're going to consider one of the most amazing works of God. When the word became flesh, dwelt among us. Like John says, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. Full of grace, full of mercy. Consider that... <clears throat> We were not just undeserving, but ill-deserving of his love, ill-deserving of his favor, ill-deserving even of his attention. And yet he, because of his goodness, because of his own glory, because of his love, because of his mercy, acted upon us with such amazing grace that Jesus would come and bear our penalty in his own body, cover our rebellion and sin with his blood, save us, redeem us, bring us into his family, not wipe the slate clean, 
but treat us as if we've done everything right, everything perfect, like Jesus, the Holy One of Heaven. And then we're going to, together, all together, uh, whether you have the most beautiful voice or you are the proverbial clashing symbol, we're going to make a joyful exclamation, a joyous boast in the majesty of God and what he's done for us. So let's come gather around the table, remember Jesus, and sing of his gloriousness together. Let's do it.